Now at 11, a 75-year-old mystery solved. Scientists discover a lost submarine at the bottom of the sea. I always wondered as a little kid if maybe he was out there somewhere. And we just didn't know it. Now the family of a local sailor on board finally has some closure. A mom is rattled after she finds bullet holes in her home. I'm grateful that my kids were home, that we were home. It's part of seven shootings in Portland in just three days. But first, a KGW investigation into a dark secret hidden for decades. I really feel like he should pay. This is not okay. A fertility doctor is accused of using his own sperm to impregnate women. An Oregon woman believes that fertility doctor is her biological father. She was born through artificial insemination more than 30 years ago, and the donor was supposed to be anonymous. Now she says she's not the only one being lied to. Investigative reporter Kyla Boshi has her story. Got all the pictures you need. Looking back, Crystal McFeeders has fond memories of her childhood. I do remember that. But there was always one question that baby photos and newspaper clippings could never answer. I wonder. And Who was her biological father? It was always in the back of my mind, like maybe I'll find him someday. Crystal's parents had always been very open, explaining, unlike her two older siblings, she'd been conceived through artificial insemination with a donor sperm. So we wanted to have a third child and we were unable to do so. In the early 1980s, Crystal's mother, Diane, was living in western Colorado, where she sought help from a fertility clinic. I really was desperate to have a baby. Diane was assured the clinic would match her with an anonymous sperm donor. And on October 27, 1984, she delivered a six pound, eight ounce little girl. This is the letter from the doctor. The fertility doctor, Paul B. Jones, signed a letter of congratulations. I am so happy to hear of the birth of your new little girl. Crystal, now 35 years old, is a mother of her own, living in Springfield, Oregon. And like millions of others, she took a consumer DNA test, hoping it might answer that decades old question, who is her biological father? At first, the results came back empty, but then, Crystal found a close match. And I was like, oh, well, this is interesting. Maybe it's a half-sister. After some hesitation, Crystal decided to send this stranger, Maya, a message. So I opened the email, and it was from a woman saying that we were a close familial match and were likely half-sisters. Crystal and Maya stayed in touch when suddenly more matches started popping up half-siblings, each with the same DNA of the same unknown father. We finally ended up with a brother and then some more sisters and then another brother, and we're like, well, this is kind of weird. Soon, this group of strangers started connecting the genetic dots from Oregon to Colorado. It was very weird. It was very weird to, to see that. And even South Dakota. It was one after another, and we all have the same story. We now know of 10 children, born between 1976 and 1997. Each of the half-siblings we've spoken with said their mothers visited the same clinic in Grand Junction, Colorado, and each sought fertility assistance from Dr. Paul B. Jones. He'd promised to use an anonymous donor. It was a common practice at the time, because doctors needed fresh samples to improve the odds of fertilization. So they'd recruit donors from nearby med schools or law students. But this lawsuit, filed just weeks ago in Colorado, claims Dr. Jones didn't use an anonymous donor as promised. Instead, he used his own fresh sperm to artificially inseminate Maya's mom. And the lawsuit claims, using DNA testing, Crystal had determined that the two of them were half-siblings through the same donor father, Dr. Jones, along with at least five other siblings. I really feel like he should pay. This is not okay. And he needs to know it's not okay. Dr. Paul Jones is now 80 years old. Have you seen this DNA test? Our sister station, KUSA in Denver, confronted him outside of his Colorado home. Did you father these children? <laughs> That's an impertinent question. Why is that an impertinent question? Because I'm not gonna answer it. Do you think at some time it's, you're gonna answer this question? Maybe Did, in court. Under oath. Do you think there are others? Oh, I'm, I'm sure there's others. 
over you know 25 year span, there has to be others. Despite feeling betrayed, Crystal says this DNA surprise doesn't change her life story. When you were first born. <laughs> she grew up loved and supported. No hair. And her family no. just continued to grow with the discovery of half siblings she never knew. Since this story came to light, Dr. Jones surrendered his medical license in Colorado. He denied to the state medical board that he used his own sperm to impregnate several patients. Kyle Boshi, KGW News. If you have a story idea for Kyle to investigate, give him a call at 503-226-5041. Or you can email callkyle at kgw.com. Now let's get you caught up on tonight's headlines. A person was hit and killed by a car in Salem tonight. Happened on Portland Road Northeast at Wayside Terrace. The person was in a marked crosswalk when they were hit. Witnesses tried to save them, but the person died at the scene. The driver stopped is cooperating with police. At last check, Portland Road was still closed for this investigation. Police are looking for the driver of a white pickup truck involved in a deadly hit and run. This happened in Portland's Pearl District. The driver hit a woman near Northwest 9th and Gleason overnight. Investigators say the woman had been riding in the truck and somehow fell out of the passenger door. Portland police are asking anyone with surveillance video that might have recorded the truck to give them a call. And nationally tonight, there is word former U.S. President Jimmy Carter is in the hospital. He reportedly is having surgery to relieve pressure on his brain caused by bleeding from recent falls. The procedure is scheduled for tomorrow morning. A shock to the conscience. That's how police are describing an awfully violent weekend in Portland. There were more than half a dozen shootings. And listen to this, a stray bullet from one of the shootings actually hit a child's bed. KGW's Mike Benner is following the latest. He's live in Northeast Portland, Mike. Yeah, Laurel, we're actually in the Lloyd District near Northeast 7th and Broadway. And I want you to take a look here at this parking meter. It was hit by three bullets. This was from a shooting Friday night and the start of what would be a busy day and a half for police. No, thank God. This mother who did not want to share her name is breathing a sigh of relief. This after the apartment she shares with her kids was damaged by gunfire. The only bullet that went through is the one that went through my bedroom window okay. and the other one stopped in the wall. Scary, no doubt. But it was even more terrifying for another family in the same apartment complex near Southeast 126th and Stark. We're told a bullet went through an exterior wall and hit a child's bed. A car in the parking lot was also tagged by gunfire. It's scary. People need to be men and not use guns. They need to use, like, it's not how you're supposed to handle your problems. It's very worrisome. Detectives are so concerned because the Friday night shooting in Southeast Portland was the first of seven over the course of a 30 hour span. There was another shooting in Southeast Portland, three in Northeast Portland and two in North Portland. Certainly uh, it does kind of shock the conscience even for police officers to see this many shootings uh, over the course of one weekend. Investigators do not believe the shootings are connected, but that does very little to ease the fear of those living near the shooting scenes. In fact, the mother we introduced you to is moving out of her first floor apartment and into a much safer one. I told them that we were scared and we didn't want to be there no more. All right, back out here live. Police want to hear from anyone who knows anything about these shootings. They're also looking for surveillance videos, so check those cameras. Get in touch with the Portland Police Bureau if you have anything that can help with this investigation. Let's send it back to you. Yeah, I really feel for the people in that community, the families there. Mike, thank you. 75 years ago, a Vancouver man was one of the 80 sailors who vanished when a torpedo sunk their submarine off the coast of Japan. Today, though, a big announcement. Explorers have finally found the remains of the USS Grayback. As Catherine Cook reports, his family is getting a gift of closure on this Veterans Day. He was very good natured. They called him Beefy. <laughs> that was his nickname. Everything Dolores Matthews and her brother David Magel know about their uncle Harold, they learn from their mom. Our mom was about a year and a half older than him. It's how they learned he went to school in Salmon Creek and how when Harold was 19, he joined the Navy. He had joined the Navy after Pearl Harbor and then came home and told, told Grandpa. And I don't think Grandpa was very happy. But what happened to Leslie Harold Leaf after that? We just knew that he was lost at sea and didn't know what happened. Is a story no relative could ever pass down. I don't like that thought of what actually happened when they were underwater and 
Their sub got bombed, and that was my uncle. Harold was aboard the USS Grayback, one of 52 submarines lost during World War II. A team of explorers from Lost 52 Project had long been searching for its remains. Then, on Sunday, they announced that back in June, they had finally discovered them. And I thought that was amazing. The Grayback was more than 1,400 feet underwater, 50 miles south of Okinawa. A torpedo had sunk the sub, killing all 80 sailors aboard. To see that picture, that plaque that's on the submarine itself that says USS Grayback Submarine, that, that really kind of brings it home. It makes it real. They remember their grandmother never took the service flag down from her window. She was always waiting for Uncle Harold to come home. And of course, when we, we didn't, at that point, they didn't really know what had happened. So there was always that little bit of a thought that maybe one of these days he would come walking down the driveway. Harold would be 97 today. A lot of people like my uncle that gave them, gave their, their life, gave all they had. And while David and Dolores could never meet their uncle. He gave his life for our country and our freedom. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing they found it. They can finally say goodbye. The USS Grayback is the fifth World War II submarine that explorers with Lost 52 Project have found, and it almost didn't happen. After several technical problems, the crew was ready to give up, and then on the last quarter of the last line of data the team reviewed, the Grayback rolled across the monitor. Wow. They were that to close found. to just yep. leaving that area, and who, who knows if they would have ever gone back to search at that spot again. Mm -hmm. I know wow. you worked on this story today. Yeah. That, that story yeah. just gives me chills that yeah. so many people like Harold lost at sea, and, yeah. and to, that he, he's back with his family, with his memory today on Veterans Day, and really brings home their sacrifice, sure does. doesn't yeah. it? And we salute all of them. Thanks, yes, we Catherine. do. Thank you, Catherine.